message is titled, God's Mercy and My Failures. So, I'd like to be an example to you of that last part there and the first part. Uh, you know, years ago, I went skiing. How many, by the way, have ever made or done something really dumb? You've done something really dumb? How many of you have never done anything really dumb? You've never, ever made a bad decision or anything? Well, you're going to ask your wife about that, Dale. I think we can probably find a list from today. But uh, that ended up sounding funnier than I really meant for it to. Hang on, I got I to... Gotta, this thing is weird. Okay, let's see if I can get it to behave. All right, maybe that's better. <laughs> All right, so I know some people are going to be watching online. Is that messing anybody up? Can you see? Some of you are glad. Bill's like, I can't see your face. It's the best angle ever for a video camera. Listen, if you're watching online because you couldn't make it because of the storm, and you maybe showed up at church on Sunday morning, and Bob had to tell you that we didn't have church, I want to say I'm really sorry. And I hope you'll enjoy this video. And all of these people want to say they appreciate you. So would you guys let them know you appreciate them? So, I'm glad you're here and you can give online if you want to. Uh, anyway, so... Um, did you like that? Just threw that in there real quick. Is that all right? Uh, so we're going to talk about God's mercy and my failures. When I was in high school, I went snow skiing for the first time. And I grew up in Miami, so I didn't even know what to wear. So I had to ask questions and stuff. I think I wore like a parka. And uh, it, I did more waterproof pants. I mean, I got soaking. I didn't realize that snow and water are the same thing. I mean, I knew that, but if you've never been skiing, you get really wet. So the first day I went skiing and I took the lesson and tried skiing, I was really good at it. By the end of the day, uh, at the very end of the day, I went on my first black diamond. So I went, I can't remember the colors, but I went on my first black diamond. I remember I was terrified because you can't, when you go on a black diamond, you actually can't see where you're going. So the end of the first day, I did a black diamond. I was so impressed. So we went back the second day. So I got up there and thought, hey, I went on a black diamond yesterday. I'll go start there today. Somehow between the first day and the second day, I forgot everything. I mean, every, I had no idea. Uh, I, I remembered Wedge. But that doesn't really work on a black diamond, just so you know. Just, I learned that that day. So, so I, I went up with my, my friends. They wanted to go on the black diamond. I said, sure, man, I did it yesterday. I can do it again. When it, I just went straight. I just went straight. I mean straight. And I went, and thankfully it wasn't this huge ski place, but I went straight, could not turn, could not slow down. Wedging does not work. I don't know how fast I was going, but I hit a waist-high fence. Thankfully, I was young and dumb and flexible, and I hit the fence, my skis flew off, and I rolled over the fence and ended up in the grass, or the hay, or whatever they had there. I don't really remember a lot. <laughs> On the other side of the fence, and I'll never forget, I had to get, my friends, of course, come down behind me, because I was much faster, <laughs> much faster than they were, and we're looking over the, it was like, I would say it's the most embarrassing thing I've ever done, but it's really not. But it was pretty up there at that point. And um, probably dropping the cymbals while the choir was singing uh, was probably the most embarrassing. But we'll tell that story another day. Uh, but, they, you know, they come look at me. I, got, I had to get my skis. I had to go back and start over on the little kids, like little kids, where they're skiing like this and stuff. And you're going, oh, I couldn't remember anything. I had to start all over again. Now, the good news is I didn't get killed that day. And the bad news is I didn't learn my lesson in life because one of the things we're going to talk about tonight is a lot of times one of the reasons that we struggle is because we overestimate our strengths. And so we're going to look at just a few reasons here, um, looking at this idea and the miracle of mercy. We're going to ask what causes our personal failures. If you've ever messed up, if you've ever blown it, whether it's uh, in marriage or work or life or maybe with your finances uh, maybe it has to do with your time management. Maybe it has to do with how you treat other people. Maybe it's with your family. Um, sometimes you have to admit, I just really blow it. I have done or said really dumb things. And um, so I'd like to welcome you to the club, by the way, if you have. All right, here's why. Number one, we overestimate, we overestimate our strengths. Now, tonight we're going to look at, at the Apostle Peter. Now, Peter, Jesus ended up calling the rock 
but he didn't really start out that way. And so um, Peter made a lot of mistakes. And if you know anything about the Apostle Peter, he tended to be impulsive. There were a lot of other things. But we're going to look at this idea tonight, and I want to look at how we relate to Peter in this idea. Number one, we overestimate our strengths. We tend to think we can handle things. Matthew 26, 33, Jesus is sitting at dinner, and, and he basically tells him, you're going to fall away, Peter. And Peter says this in Matthew 26, 33. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. That's pretty bold. I mean, Jesus just looked at him and said, you're going to fall. And he said, listen, even if everybody else does, not me. I got your back, Jesus. And, and I mean, he did it first. Remember, he cut off the guard's ear. I mean, he was ready to go. And then Jesus grabbed the ear and said, what in the heck are you doing? And put the guy's ear back on. By the way, I've always thought if you were that guard at that point, do you get to go home? Is there workers' comp? How does that work? I, I don't know. But, you know, if you cut off a guy's ear um, with a sword, that's pretty intense. That was Peter. And Peter said, I'll never fall away. And he started out really good. And then it continues. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, and by the way, declared is like he yelled at Jesus, which, by the way, can I give you a hint about life? Yelling at God is never a good thing. Just, just take that. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you, right? You can almost hear Peter believing what he's saying. He estimates, I can do this. I can do this. And all, and then he said, and then he said, we'll never disown you. And listen, listen to what it says. You probably never noticed this. And all the other disciples said the same. So it wasn't just Peter. The other disciples all went, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I wonder if Judas did that too. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know. All right. Listen, you, people fail in business all the time because they overestimate what they're good at. They fail in life all the time. A lot of us might know where we are weaknesses but we don't really know where our strengths end. And because we think we have strengths, we tend to overestimate what we're able to do. So we think we can get everything done. We think we can do a little more than what we really can do. We think that we can take on a task that maybe is not meant for us, or we tend to think we're a little better at something than we really, really are. In 1 Corinthians, it says it this way. If you think I am strong, I can handle this. I'll never fall for that temptation. Then be careful, for you could easily fall too. When you begin to think, I could never mess up. I could never blow it. I would never do that. When you watch TV and you see somebody do something and you sit there and you go, I can't believe they did that. <laughs> Haven't you done that? I've done that this week. I did that yesterday. I saw something on TV and I went, what an idiot. I would never do, oh, wait a second. What's my sermon on again? Right? <laughs> we do it all the time. Some of you did that today when I told you about the generator. By the way, if you're watching online, I'm not telling you, you're out of luck. Uh, so, but anyway, some of you, you want me to tell them too? No, no? you're out of luck, okay, you can call me. Uh, anyway, so if you think I'm strong, here's what happens. If you and I are given the right circumstances, we are capable of any sin. Now, I'm not saying you'll commit any sin. And I'm not telling you to try that. And I'm not telling you to use that as an excuse. But the truth is, given the right circumstances, you and I have to realize that we are weak. And this idea that Peter, Jesus is looking at him going, listen, you could fall. And Peter's like, oh, no, I could never fall. And he says the same thing to us. If you think you could never have an affair, and you think you're so, oh, well, I was just flirting with her, or we were just going to dinner and having a nice conversation. Listen, I sit with people all the time who tell me their stories, and the story always starts out with, I never thought that I would be a drug addict. I never thought that I would have an affair. I never thought that I would cheat the government, or try to cheat the government, by the way. When they come see me, it's usually after they get caught. So they go, I never thought that I would try to cheat the government. You know, I never thought that this would happen. In over 20-something years as a pastor, I've heard everybody. All of us are fallible. All of us are not perfect. And when you and I start to think, I would never do that, be very careful. That's a dangerous point to be. 
A lot of times we know where our weakness is, but we don't realize where our strength ends. And sometimes it's your very strength that gets you in trouble. Sometimes it's the thing that you're good at that you tend to relax over and you think, well, I would never do that because in the past, maybe you were good at that. Maybe you've made it through a difficult situation. But can I tell you something? Sometimes spiritually, when you go through a spiritual high place and you think and you're up on top of the mountain, you come back. You know, I, I deal with kids from camp and they come from back from camp. Oh, I'll never go out and party with my friends again or I'll never blah, 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 you know, whatever. I cannot tell you the number of kids. Then a month later, come back and say, mm. how you doing? Well, I wish we were back at camp. Because they don't realize that what happens sometimes is you go and have a spiritual experience and you start to think, now I'm better than that. Instead, we need to cry out for God's mercy. Instead, we need to say, you know what, God? Even after something big, something wonderful, something awesome, where I made it through a huge challenge, I made it over a huge hill, and you helped me over it. You know what? You can make it over a huge hill and trip over the speed bump. You know how I know that? Because I've made it over huge hills and tripped over speed bumps. You, you can deal. And can I tell you something about life? I really, in life, do really well on tests. Big tests come. Hurricane's coming. Dear Lord Jesus, would you just deliver us from this hurricane? The double wall helix hurricane, Lord. Would you just wobble it? Just wobble it. Lord, we just ask for wobbling in Jesus' name. You know, whatever you pray. And, you know, and you, and you do that, right? And then the next day, right, you know, that goes away. And then you find yourself mad over something dumb. You, you just made it through something huge. And then you're like, this coffee doesn't taste good. I mean, we're, What? We pass the tests and we fail the quizzes. We do it all the time. Think about your life. If some huge event happens and you pray your way through it and you ask Jesus, oh, Jesus, help me. And then you're in traffic. La, la, la. Oh, I can't believe there are any of you. You know, and maybe you say some words you're sitting in front of your kids or my brother says he gives them hand signals. I don't know what that means. But I got to spend some time with my brother. That's what's wrong with me right now. By the way, Yuli is my brother, if you didn't know that. He's a pastor, too. By the way, that video has been watched over 15,000 times on YouTube. And a lot of people thumbs it down and give me advice on how to, how to barefoot water ski, which I find hilarious. I went ahead and posted people's advice because I'm like, okay. You know, you really should get a long robe and go off it. I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah, I weigh like 100 pounds more than I did in that video. I'm not getting no long nothing. You can drag me behind a boat by my foot. That's all you're going to do now. Number two. Did I just say all that out loud? That was supposed to be edited. And I can't edit the video. I'm going to have to upload it from my phone. So, yeah, whatever. All right, number two. We fear the disapproval of others. Now, let me tell you something because this always happens, okay? Somebody will come, and they come to me because they know me, okay? I'm a middle child. If you're, how many middle children do we have in here? You're God's chosen, okay? I just want you to point out I'm four out of five, and four out of five ain't bad. That's my only joke. That's all you get, people. These are the jokes. This is all you get. Uh, from now on, it's verses. Just not. <laughs> just going to start reading. Okay. So people come to me and they say, Eric, you realize you don't have to make everybody happy. <laughs> and I usually look at them and go, really? I don't? No, no. I, I can make everybody. No, only a clown makes everybody happy, by the way. You don't have to make everybody happy. But can I tell you a secret? Because some of you are on the other side. You don't have to make everybody miserable either. So usually the person who comes and tells you, you know, you don't have to make everybody happy. That's the one you need to look at and go, well, you don't need to make everybody miserable. It's usually that. Think about the last person who said that to you. Because there's always somebody. And the reason they say it to you is they're trying to show that they're a little better than you. You know, Eric, <laughs> if you would like me and didn't care what other people think, <laughs> you would be spiritual. <laughs> Why do you know that person? Do you know? Okay, you know who it is. All right. <laughs> he pointed at himself. That was awesome. I just realized what you did, you went, me. So this one, though, let me be honest with you, and you can go to sleep after this, okay? The squirrels have been running. Have you noticed? The squirrels are alive. Yep. Yep. It's not, see? It's not, just, it's not just your dad that you have to say, right? So, what was I talking about? Squirrels. Before the squirrels. I was saying something important that mattered. Remember? 
You, 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 you. Oh, oh, okay. Let me tell you about something about free We feel the approval. This one, this one though, is the most dangerous one of all these. Because here's the deal: if you try to please anybody above God, you will make choices that are wrong, and you will pursue sin, and you won't even mean to pursue sin because you're trying to make somebody happy, and you will compromise your values. If you're in high school, you'll give in to temptation that you shouldn't, whether it's alcohol or drugs, or whether it's it's just you know, sexual temptation or whatever to try to please other people. As an adult, you'll, you'll bend your convictions at work. You'll, you'll do things that you wouldn't do otherwise because you put people before God. And let me tell you something. Anytime you put people before God, you begin to make wrong choices. It's very easy. Look all through the Bible. That was Saul's problem. He put people before God. There were, there were all kind of kings in the Old Testament that did that. So here's what happens. Matthew 26, a little bit later, of course, Jesus is arrested. Peter tries to cut the guy's ear off, remember? And Jesus goes, that's not what we're doing here. Peter followed Jesus at a distance. Time out. Did you know nothing's in the Bible by accident here? You know when you and I get in trouble? When we try to follow Jesus at a distance. When we try to say, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm a Are you a Christian? Well, yeah, I kind of said are you a Christ follower? Well, oh, Christ follower. I mean, at a distance. I mean, I went to church. I mean, it was funny, so I went. I mean, come on, you know. And we start to compromise and we begin to push away our real faith. And we don't want to tell people that we're a Christ follower. But it gets worse. Worse. I say worse. It gets worse. It gets worse than that. By the way, this is my hillbilly hand. When I do this, it means you might be a redneck if you use the word worster. And you're not talking about the sauce you put on a steak. <laughs> All right. Peter followed Jesus at a distance to the courtyard of the high priest's palace. By the way, I always think Peter was at least better than the other disciples. They weren't even following at a distance. They were running like the wind. And he sat down with the guards to see what was going to happen to Jesus. You know, the other time we get in trouble. When we just try to see what's happening on the outside. When we just say, I just want to try that. I just want a taste of that. I just want to see what that's like. I just want to watch that show for a little bit. Everybody's been talking about it. I want to see. And we allow garbage to fill our minds and our hearts. And then we wonder why we struggle with certain things. We wonder why we struggle with worldliness when what we do pursue and what we allow into our minds are the very things. We're just, we're just going to watch. We're just going to watch. And then it continues. As he was sitting in the courtyard, a servant girl came up to him and said, You were with Jesus of Galilee, weren't you? By the way, they recognized him because of his accent. Um, Galileans tended to be hillbillies. The Bible is written in Koine Greek, by the way, which is hillbilly Greek. So those of you who are hillbillies here, you have a lot in common. If you're really smart here, it's okay. Some of the Bible was written in really highfalutin Greek. But most of it was Koine Greek, which was like, hey, how's it going? Anyway, so as he was sitting in the courtyard, a servant girl came up to him and said, You were with Jesus of Galilee, weren't you? But standing there in front of everyone, you ever feel that way? Peter denied it. I don't even know what you're talking about, he said. He was more concerned with people than God. Maybe you're afraid to share your faith. Maybe you're following Jesus at a distance. Maybe you're waiting for something to happen. Maybe you're waiting for somebody to ask you. Maybe if they ask me the right way. But not in front of people. I mean, come on. Maybe for, you know. Do you ever ask yourself the question, why do other people's opinions matter so much? I don't like this next question, but I'm going to ask you, okay? You ever wonder why criticism bothers you so much? Maybe it's because you think what that person says is more important than what God says about you. Now, here's the biggest thing. If you don't get anything else tonight again, last one, last one. If you will discover what God thinks about you, you will be less concerned about what other people think about you. I don't know how to stress that anymore. I don't, know how to, I don't have time to teach on that for an hour. But the truth is, if you'll discover how much God loves you, you will care less about what other people think because you'll realize how much he loves you. You may have had a daddy that didn't love you. You may have had a mama that didn't love you. You may have had somebody that you cared about reject you. But God never, ever does that. In Proverbs 29, it says it this way. It's a dangerous trap to be concerned with what others think of you. But if you trust the Lord, you'll be safe. You'll be safe. 
If you want to know what God thinks about you, it involves mercy and it involves grace. He is not sitting in heaven with a baseball bat waiting to whack you over and over. Old and New Testament. You read even Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Even Jeremiah, as he spoke, he was not a bullfrog. Even as he spoke. He was a good friend of mine, though. He was. Hey, he let me drink. Oh, never mind. Okay, so... Hey, joy to the world, people. Just all the boys and girls. By the way, young people in here are going, why are people laughing when he said joy to the world? Joy to the world is what they're thinking. All right. Do you even know what I'm singing? Any idea? Okay, good. I feel better. It's like the word chalkboard. Chalkboard's like, what? Chalkboard? Chalkboard? Dry erase? Is that like a dry erase board? Okay, sorry. So we need to learn about his mercy. We need to learn about his grace. So let me ask you this question. When's the last time you said to God, God, why does criticism matter so much to me? God, why do I feel so rejected in this circumstance with these people? Because some of us are in soul pain. We, we are hurting spiritually and we don't even realize it because we've never taken time to really examine our lives and say, why do I care more about what that person says than what God says? And so pray about that. You save yourself a lot of counseling when you're old to go to God and say, God, would you help me to figure out why do I care so much about what that person says? And I believe if you're a Christian that the Holy Spirit will reveal that to you. Whether it's somebody in your life that was significant that never gave you the love you want, you know, whatever the deal is. But I honestly think God can show you that without a psychiatry book that he can reveal that to you. Now, if you get stuck, the Bible says he gives us a wisdom of counselors, okay? But the truth is, sometimes you just pray and God will show you. And you may not like it. When God speaks, sometimes I go, no, nah, it's not that. Number three. I'm, I'm going to skip number three because I don't like it. Number three. We speak without thinking. I never do that. Goodness gracious. This is when we're hasty. It's when we're thoughtless. It's when we say damaging words. When we say impulsive things. And here's what happens. Let me tell you what it is. We are acting emotionally instead of rationally. And all the rational people in here are like, that's exactly right. You tell them. Now, some of you rational people need to be able to put some of your rational and love people around you and put some of that away and be a little impulsive with your love because that's your weakness. But some of you impulsive people need to learn to not let your emotions run your mouth. You hear that, Brookins? <laughs> Not you, Joanna. Not you, Joanna. Okay. There is another Brookins. There's a couple of Brookins in the room. By the way, my mother called everybody, every number she could find today to ask about everybody and make sure they were okay. And so if you didn't get a call, she just couldn't find you. It wasn't that she didn't want to. She was looking for you. And, you know, how dare you give her a wrong number? All right. Matthew 26 says, see that speaking without thinking? We know that you're one of them. Because of your Galilean accent gives you away. What do you mean? I'm not from, I'm not from the hills. I'm from Southern California. Right? I mean, that's what it was like. They, he was talking, and they were like, your accent gives you away. He's like, what do you mean? I don't know what you mean. I'm not from that place. I'm from England, right? You know, I mean, that's, that's how bad it was. It was such a divide that he couldn't fake it. He couldn't pretend. You could almost see him going there and going, Yes, sir, old chap, how art thou? Are you? Matey. So then Peter lost his temper and he started cursing. And the NIV it says he called curses down from heaven, which is the same idea as us cussing, by the way. It would be like if all of a sudden you just went blankety blank. By the way, by the way, most people cuss to try to get power and control. That's why I worked construction as a kid with my dad. That's what it was about. Somebody didn't do what you wanted to. You wanted to move a little faster. So what'd you do? I mean, watch Deadliest Catch. Hey, boo! All right, I'll get on it. 
I'll get the net put up, right? And, and what are they doing? They're trying to control him. So they think by using profanity, it's going to help. Well, it's the same thing. He thought, they don't believe me, so what do I do? i got to cuss. i got to show them that what I say is real. He started cursing and swearing. He shouted, I don't know the man. Immediately, he heard the rooster crow. Can I tell you what Satan does right here? Satan does this with every sin. He tells you that sin's no big deal. That sin's no big deal. That sin's no big deal. And as soon as you commit the sin, you know what Satan says? That was the biggest sin you've ever made. That's the dumbest thing you've ever done. You should, God hates your guts. And I can hear when that rooster crowed, Peter just go, oh, everything. You just hear, you can almost feel the wall of shame just come rolling over him. The tongue is a small thing, but what enormous damage it can do. Just as a tiny spark can burn up a great forest, the tongue is a flame of fire. If you're a country, flame of fire. That part of your body that's full of wickedness and can poison everything else in your life, it is set on fire by hell itself and can turn our whole lives into a blazing flame of destruction and disaster. Do you know anybody like that? You're like, they're a good person, but I can't hang around them. You ever say anything that you wish you could take back? What if instead, when you find yourself impatient and frustrated, you learn to receive God's mercy and give away God's mercy? Because typically when we yell at people, it's when we think we're a little better than they are. Typically when you're frustrated or irritated or angry at somebody, it's because they're not doing what you think they should do the way you think they should do it. And they're not measuring up to the way you think they should measure up. So what do you do? You get mad and you say something like you're superior to them. It's arrogance. It's pride. Let's be honest about it and confess it to God and say, God, heal me. So here's three things we should do when we fail real quickly. Number one, grieve. You know, it's okay to grieve. It's okay to be sad. The Bible doesn't say not to grieve. The Bible says we, we don't have to grieve. Even when somebody dies, you don't have to grieve as those without, no, without any hope. But you do grieve. When Peter heard the rooster crow, he remembered that Jesus had said, Before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Listen, then Peter went outside and wept bitterly. You ever weep over your stupidity? You ever weep over a dumb decision you made? You have to take time to grieve. You have to let God work on you. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. But let me tell you something. You can't rush healing. You can't rush through these steps of pain. You can't rush through and think, well, if I just do this book or just read that or just attend this class, then I'll make it through that easy. Listen, everything you go through in life, whether it's a business failure, whether it's a divorce, whether it's a traumatic situation, it takes time to get better. When people come to me six months after a divorce and they say I'm marrying so-and-so, I'm like, whoa, back up there. Let's see what's going on. Have, you know, oh, no, I walked right through the steps. And then later their spouse comes to me and goes, they didn't walk through the steps. I'm like, you know, be careful after a big event. And no, listen, for some of you, you need to give yourself some grace. It's okay if you don't heal right away. It's okay if you don't feel normal right away when you go through something hard. But be honest with God. Can I tell you what some of us need to do? If you're really struggling, especially with your mouth and your impulsiveness or people pleasing, just admit to God, God, I can't do this. God, on my own, in my flesh, I can't do this. I need your help. I need your help. The sacrifice God wants is a broken and contrite spirit. God will not reject a humble and repentant heart. Take time. Whenever Satan reminds you, when the rooster crows in your life and it reminds you of something painful or something dumb that you've done and Satan comes to you and says, you're a failure, you're a joke, you're a mess. You know what? And Neil and I have talked about this as pastors. You know, sometimes Satan does that to us. We walk on the building and we go. And let me tell you what, when Satan comes to me and says, you're an idiot, you know what I say? You're right. But God loves idiots. And God uses idiots, and he uses failures, and he uses broken people, and he uses messed up people, and he uses imperfect people, and he uses me, and he uses you, and he uses people who make dumb mistakes and open up their generator to check the oil while it's running, and, you know, all kind of dumb people who do dumb things. Read the Bible. Half of the Bible was written by murderers. 
And he used them. And he'll use you. So when Satan comes to you and says, you're useless, you're worthless, you don't matter, you say to him, well, that would be true, except God's mercy and God's grace is bigger than all of that. In your face, Satan. Number two, let my small group support me. Jesus formed a small group. Disciples formed a small group. Early church, your first few hundred years, small groups. On Easter morning, Mary Magdalene went and found the disciples together. And what were they doing? Grieving and weeping. When you grieve with people, it halves the grief. When you rejoice with people, it doubles the joy. It's like double mint gum. Get some people around you. Don't think you can live the Christian life on your own. Please don't be one of these things like, I can do it all by myself. Because there's going to come a day that you can't. And right now there's people around you that can't, that you can help. And there'll come a day when you fall and you need their help to get up. A week later, the disciples were together again. What were they doing? Meeting in a home. You and I were made for community. We were made to be together. So let me ask you, are you in a small group? I don't care if you can't join one of our small groups. I'm not trying to say our small groups are the only. Get with another Christian. Make a commitment to meet with them. I don't care if you meet with them once a month. But say, let's get together and let's just talk about what we're reading in the Bible. I mean, it doesn't have to even be complicated. I used to do with a, a group of men I used to meet, we used to do soap. Because we're dumb and we had to have something easy to remember. We could remember soap. I mean, we didn't always remember it, but we remembered the words. S stood for scripture, so we said, what scripture are you reading? O stood for outreach, we'd say, who are you reaching out to? A stood for accountability, what are you struggling with? And P, can you imagine what that stood for? Prayer, we pray for each other. So soap, you can do a soap group. I don't care, if you can't get in one of our small groups, get with some people. I've been in small groups for over 30 years of my life, and it has changed my life. It's where my real friends are, it's where people grow deeper, it's where we encourage each other. It's when I fall, they lift me up, and it's where God speaks to me. Number four, cast myself on God's mercy. So Peter goes through all this stuff. He falls, he messes up. Jesus restores him. And listen, Peter wrote two books of the Bible, first and second Peter. Duh, you know, I know that's a shocker. That's why I went and got my doctorate, people, so I could tell you stuff like that, right, doctor? Here's what Peter says. Because of his great mercy, God has given us, and he's talking about himself. God has given us a new life by raising Jesus Christ from death. This fills us with a living hope. And then he says this in 1 Peter 5, 7, a little bit later. Cast all your anxiety on him, for he cares for you. Stop there for just a second. Put this verse on your refrigerator. It doesn't say some. It doesn't say a little. It says cast all. And this word cast in the Greek is this really cool word. It, it's, kind of, it's kind of the idea of taking a rock and throwing it. Once you throw it, you can't get it back. It implies what they did where they threw blankets on a horse. You ever throw blankets on a horse? I don't know. I don't have a horse. But when you throw blankets on a horse, if you're not holding that horse, guess what? You just lost your blankets. <laughs> when you cast your anxiety on God, you know what happens? You just lost your anxiety. But will you do it? A lot of us say, God, take my anxiety, and then we focus on it. <laughs> God, you take this rock. Wait a second. Let me hold on to it for just a minute longer. God, you take those blankets. Wait a second. I really like this. You know, if I don't hold on to this blanket, I will not feel in control. By the way, you know why people worry? Because we think somehow it helps us to control the world. It's the same reason we complain. Do you know why we complain about people, about things? It's because we think if we complain about it, then when something happens, we go, I knew it. You heard about the pessimist who died, right? And how this tombstone it said? I knew it. So can you cast your cares on him? When you cast your care, you lose despair. Some of you are despairing because you haven't done that. Some of you just need to pray, God, I can't control anything. Did you know that's one of the first things in Alcoholics Anonymous? Basically, I'm not in charge. I can't do this. Some of us tonight, the first thing we need to do is say that. And God, I throw myself on your mercy. And that way when Satan comes and he attacks you and says you're not good enough, you can go, you're right. But God is. All right, so what does Jesus do with our failures? These are all quick. This is in Luke chapter 22. If that's Jesus, please answer. <laughs> Number one, you need to know when you sin and when you blow it, God's not shocked. 
When Peter blew it, Jesus told him, you're going to blow it ahead of time. Sometimes when we blow it, we're, afraid, we're like Adam and Eve. We go and hide. We think God doesn't want to talk to me. God's not in heaven going, where did you go? When God asked Adam and Eve, where are you? He wasn't asking them because he didn't know where they were. He wanted them to know where they were. So when, God, when you run from God, he's asking, where are you? But not for his benefit. Where are you? So tonight the question is, where are you? He's not shocked at where you are. Did you know he prays for you? Isn't that good to know? You know, when somebody says to me, I'm praying for you, did you know that means in my, two things happen to me. Number one, I'm very thankful. I think, oh, somebody's praying for me. The second thing that happens is I go, you know, they must like me. I mean, they didn't say I'm praying against you. Maybe they meant that. I'm praying for you to die, right? <laughs> Number three, he believes in us. There's several verses there. I don't have time to go through them, but Luke 22, 32, Jesus, when he rises from the dead, he's with the other disciples and he says, go tell Peter. He specifically says, go tell Peter. That's so awesome to me. He believed in Peter. Still to the, at that time, he said, you're the rock. He's like, I feel like the paperweight. He's like, no, 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 you're the rock. I feel like the paper. No, you're the rock. But I'm not even sure I love you. You're the rock. Jesus, you know all things. Number four, he shows us mercy when we're down. Did you know he doesn't beat you up? He doesn't uh, hit you with shame. He hits you with mercy. You can look at those verses in John 21 where he restores Peter. He will never give up on you. And did you know what the Bible says? It says he will never be unfaithful to you. Sometimes you're going to be unfaithful to God. You're going to cheat on God. But he'll never cheat on you. Number five. He uses our failures to build his church. So here's the final two questions tonight. Number one. What failure have you had that God can use to build his church? Maybe you're here and you struggle with alcohol. Have you used that to help someone else? Maybe, maybe I know somebody who had an abortion. And they use that part of their story to help other girls who are going through that time. Maybe you were rejected as a child. Maybe your parents gave you up. Maybe you were abused. I don't know what you've been through, but allow God to use that pain to help other people. Now, that doesn't mean you have to get up and tell everybody about it. But I can't tell you the number of times that I've been sitting with somebody and they mention something. And I'm like, oh, do I really need to tell them that I understand? I say, I understand. I understand. I know how that feels. I've been there with you. And when you, uh, when you do that for other people, you help build them up. You help them walk through. Whether it's a struggle with alcohol or drugs or something else, use the hurt in your life to be a blessing to other people. And then finally, are you going to respond to your failure like Judas or Peter? Listen carefully. We're going to end with this. Judas became a traitor. Peter became a teacher. Judas had a breakdown. J J uh, Peter had a breakthrough. Judas gave up. Peter looked up. Judas died in condemnation. Peter lived on in celebration. Fifty days after Peter's biggest failure, only fifty days, fifty days, fifty days ago, he denied Jesus. Fifty days ago, he tried to cut off the guy's ear. Fifty days ago, he said, blankety blank, I don't know that guy, blankety blank. Fifty days, he gives a sermon. And over 3,000 people came to know Christ. Fifty days. So how can God use your hurt? How can he use your struggle, your pain, your suffering, your weakness? I want to encourage you, fall at his mercy. That's why we need the cross. The cross represents that Jesus died for us because we know we can't have it together. And to become a Christian, it basically means, Jesus, I know I need the cross. I know I don't deserve anything good, but because you gave your life for me, I surrender to you. I fall at the foot of the cross and I give you my life. Help me to walk with you. When you become a follower of Jesus, it says that he takes all of your junk and all of your sin and all of your failures and he throws it out of his memory and he says, let's start over. You're now righteous. And when you blow it again and you mess up, you know what Jesus says? You're righteous. I forgive you. 
The Bible talks about how he's given us his righteousness, not your righteousness, not your good works. It is by faith, grace, you're saved through faith. It's not by your works. That's why we can't brag. That's why we can't think we're better than anybody because it's only by his grace. So if you're here tonight and you haven't blown it and you haven't messed up in a certain way, don't look at somebody else and say, well, look what they did. Instead say, God, thank you for your grace that I never did that dumb thing that Eric did. Because I'm smarter than him. No, don't say that second part. God, I need your grace. If you're here tonight and you've never given your life to, life to Jesus Christ, tonight's the night. You can surrender your life to him. Life can change in a moment. Did you realize that this week? Why? Life can change in a moment. 20 miles different, and this would be a whole different night. We wouldn't be meeting here. You might not have a house. We would be grieving for friends. If you're here tonight and you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that tonight. And if you're here tonight and you're like me and you realize that sometimes you're a little arrogant, maybe it's time to say, God, I need your mercy. Forgive me for thinking that I would never do something. God, I fall on your mercy. Thank you that you've given me your mercy in this area of my life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Father, I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for all the small groups. There's about 10 of them now, I thank Lord. And you just keep bringing people and people keep joining groups. And I thank you for what you are doing, amazing things, and you continue to do it. And Father, we do give you all the glory for moving that storm. But Father, we also know that sometimes in life the storms hit. And there's folks right now who need prayer and love. Lord, there's even folks in our community who've had storms in their life, maybe not physical storms, but spiritual and emotional storms. I pray, Father, that we could be with them to pick up the pieces, to help them clean up their lives. Father, to help them to come to know you. Father, in their time of need, that they would know that there's somebody there and they are no longer alone. Help us to be your hands and feet in our community physically, but help us also to be that spiritually. Help us to be there for people and to love them. I pray for that one here tonight who's never shared their hurt, that, Father, you would provide opportunities for them to quietly, one-on-one, -on -one, share that with somebody who needs to know to be lifted up by even their pain. And, Father, most of all, if somebody's here tonight who doesn't know you, I pray, Father, that they could come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have our time of giving now. Even on a weekend where we only have one service, I know a secret. God always provides for our church. He's always provided for us. We've made our budget every year. And he'll always provide for you. So as you give tonight, just be faithful. Say, God, thank you for what you've done. This is for you. We're going to have a great song at the end here. And I'll be here after the service if you want to pray. Thanks for being here tonight.